this. <laughs> okay, um, a bit of a jokey title, but basically um, it, it sort of revolves around uh, trying to extend and offer our uh, breeding and genetics sort of to other countries around the globe. And uh, our journey uh, sort of uh, from the beginning of the company to, to that point. So this is where we're located, down in the southwest uh, of England, where uh, the climate is quite mild. Um, we're well protected um, in a valley, which I'll, you'll see in a minute. Um, sort of the sea influence, and we've got Dartmoor just to the sort of um, the west of us, so that catches most of the rain. So we we've got quite a lot of we've got good good uh, light levels. The nursery started off as a market garden uh, just before the Second World War, growing uh, fruit and vegetables and flowers in the hedgerows because uh, you weren't allowed to grow them uh, in the fields then, because I think you had to produce food. Um, immediately post-war, uh, the area uh, sort of diversified into, uh, it, it, there was quite a lot of horticulture there, and, um, and quite a lot of uh, cut flowers and things like violets, Devon violets were grown and sent up to Covent Garden on the steam trains. Uh, as, as well as that, we, we're um, sort of quite favoured from a tourist point of view, but not many of them find their way down to the nursery. So if anyone has been there, they'll know why, because um, it's uh, a bit out of the way. Uh, it looks like we're right down in a hole here, but in fact, um, uh, it, it's not I don't think you'd choose to start there if you were starting a new nursery, but uh, that's how, how things quite often evolve. Uh, we have got more glass on top of an adjacent hill, but basically we've got very little flat land, so we quite often feel uh, quite envious when we see some of our friends in the east of the country and uh, in Holland. Uh, it must be uh, a lot easier to build big areas of glass. Um, we operate out of about a hectare of uh, mainly glass. Uh, a lot of it's old Robinson structures, which are a little bit leaky for air. I mean, they're fairly watertight, but, they're, uh, but that's not a bad thing because uh, the pinks that we grow, are, um, they, they like plenty of fresh air and uh, they're, they're not too, too sensitive to cold. I'll just sort of run through uh, a little bit about uh, the company and its origins, and then I'll move on to uh, the genetics uh, a little bit and our breeding, and then on to uh, some of the international um, marketing and sales side of things. Uh, our other sort of customers uh, have in the past been uh, cut flower growers, and you can see here some uh, cut pinks grown for cut flowers both inside and outside. Um, that was uh, I, when I joined the company 25 years ago, we sold about 75% or more of our uh, young plants to the cut flower growing trade. And now it's probably more like um, about 5%, I would say. And unfortunately, a lot of that was down to uh, the sort of globalization of flower growing in um, areas where labor's cheap and the weather's fine. Uh, but there is still a market for cut flower pinks um, under protection uh, for local sales because people are looking for more uh, local production and UK grown and so there, there are, uh, there's still a niche for cut flower and we still breed for cut flower varieties. So uh, they're an attractive item with uh, many more colours than just pink and um, uh, the, one of the key um, attributes is uh, perfume, which we, is one of the essential things that we uh, aim to breed into our varieties. Now, looking at some of the uh, uh, earlier varieties that uh, were available um, when uh, the uh, Wetman nurseries first started growing pinks, there was uh, Doris, which a lot of people know, and Joy, these were bred by Montague Orwood in Sussex uh, back in the 50s, I think it was. And um, uh, certainly Doris, we still sell plenty of Doris. People ask for it by name. Uh, Joy, we don't uh, sell anymore because 
it wasn't that well perfumed and we've got better things, but uh, bows were particularly used for cut flowers in the early days. Um, uh, but we have many more things to offer now. Uh, then the next phase in uh, development of the crop was uh, the breeding of Cecil Wyatt, who lived near to us in uh, Bovey Tracy. Uh, he was uh, a professional gar a sort of a professional grower, but not really a professional breeder. But he was a, he had a, a real feel for uh, the plants and how to breed them, and he produced a lot of very worthy varieties and named them after his family and after um, areas in the, in the southwest in Dartmoor. Um, John Wetman started breeding um, in, a, in a sort of fairly informal part-time way, um, probably about 30 years ago, I guess. And uh, these were some of the first varieties that uh, he raised. And these were marketed uh, through the through Pride of Place plants, uh, which was uh, some people remember, I can see Devon Cream, Devon Blush, and Devon Glow. It, we we still sell Devon Cream today. It's still very popular, and we're, we're one of the colours we're working on is a, a, a good yellow. And we haven't really we've got some material in in the breeding process, but uh, it's quite a difficult one to breed a strong yellow with with a perfume. So it's work in progress still. So that was some, uh, some of the early work. And in those days, um, it was pre the, the UPOV convention thing being accepted. And so we uh, protected them with UK plant breeders' rights in those days. And we didn't uh, transfer them to European rights. Um, since then, we've obviously uh, uh, protected varieties with the European plant variety rights. We felt we ought to diversify a little bit, and uh, because we had uh, an increasing interest in plants for gardens rather than uh, for cut flowers, we thought we, we would have a look around and see what other uh, planting material there was, but staying within our specialized spe specialization, if you like, uh, within the, the Dianthus genus. So what we did, we, we looked around at the free varieties there were available at the time and grew a few out and decided which ones to, to list and offer and had them uh, cleaned up and uh, started breeding with those as well. So um, we then, that then developed uh, the first few of the star series of Dianthus, which are the dwarf. Um, we don't actually know what goes into their makeup in terms of which species, because they were already taken from uh, existing uh, varieties that, are, that were out there. And, um, so it's a bit of an unknown quantity, really. Um, we, we, have in, um, we did have a project trying to determine the chromosome number of these to, to try and decide how best to deal with them from a breeding point of view. But uh, they seem to have rather a lot and uh, they're very small, so um, it wasn't very successful. We have also introduced um, some wild species uh, to uh, just to shuffle the genes about a bit and see what comes out of it. So we, we do from time to time include that in our breeding. Which, which attributes we're aiming to uh, include in our varieties, uh, we want something that is not all stiff and stumpy. We want something that's uh, got a bit of elegance, uh, which is quite difficult to define, but something that's not, uh, not a pot carnation, if you like. We're trying to differentiate our material from uh, other competitor material. Uh, a grey-green foliage, narrow leaves, um, something that doesn't require chilling to enable it to flower, so you can plant it in the same season. That's not to say that cold doesn't have some effect on flowering, because uh, you do get a sort of a, uh, initiation. It can be stimulated by chilling. Uh, hardiness. Uh, our varieties are sold as hardy plants. Uh, perfume and uh, good value in the garden, so um, flowering over, over a long season, not just a, a single flush, which a lot of the older varieties 
uh, tended to have just a single flush in the spring and then uh, they'd be green for the rest of the season. So we're trying to sort of develop our name associated with these things. And then there are certain other things that um, our customers are looking for. They want new colours and attractive patterns. Um, obviously, uh, they've got any varieties that we produce have to be stable uh, and uh, uniform in production. Uh, nobody wants plants that are up and down and uh, difficult to market. Uh, they shouldn't be too difficult to grow. Um, from the propagator's point of view, we need to have something that produces a reasonable number of cuttings, so it's economical to propagate. Uh, sometimes there's a bit of a conflict there because uh, people like, like varieties which um, are very showy and produce a lot of flower, but sometimes that's at the expense of um, vegetative growth. So what, what we're looking for is a good balance between flowers and cuttings and resistance to diseases. There's no, no point in introducing varieties which uh, don't survive well in the garden or have a particular weakness. So these are all things that we are looking for. Also, uh, uh, some old varieties with very double flowers, they tend to split the calyx um, rather readily and it does spoil the flower shape. Um, it's not a, that big a deal, but obviously for the cut flower, grower, it's uh, an important factor. Carolyn, the managing director, myself, Joe, uh, our production director, uh, and Letitia, we uh, sit down together to decide how much of, our, of the breeding effort is going to go into which type of plant, well, a cut flower variety or a dwarf, which category, if you like. So we agree uh, how much effort is going to go into each thing and perhaps uh, some broad out outlines as to what we're looking for, um, and we have sort of little uh, sort of subgroups that we're working on, such as perhaps a group of orange ones, uh, some yellow ones, patterned ones, large single flowers, um, and then we uh, we have the existing ranges that we want to add things to as and when we find suitable uh, subjects. And so we start off with uh, Letitia will. Uh, devise a, a suitable parents and obviously you have to grow the, grow the um, plants sort of like uh, over winter so that they're ready for pollination in the, in the early summer and we probably start that in June around that sort of time and pollination we tend to do in uh, an, uh, a cool open sided plastic structure rather than in the greenhouse because we found that it's more successful if, it's, if it doesn't get too hot. Uh, later in the summer, it can be a bit, a bit too hot under glass. So we found a higher success rate in terms of seed germination and setting from um, plants where have been pollinated in a cooler environment. Uh, so that, that's sort of um, the start. And then obviously that seed is collected, uh, dried, and uh, cleaned over the winter and then it's sown in the spring, usually around sort of February, March time, and then uh, the first... Uh, uh, if it's come from uh, like garden pinks, we tend to put, prick them out into a larger pot. If it's come from one of the dwarf varieties, we might put it in a nine centimetre pot just to be sensible with space. Uh, and then we select as and when they come into flower in the, in the early summer, um, and sort of pull, pull plants out as we uh, identify them as being of interest. Um, so, it, not unsurprisingly, that takes at least seven years from first pollination through to introduction into uh, c commerce. That's a sort of an average figure. So, it's quite a long term investment. Um, so year, year zero being the year of pollination, about three years of selection, uh, whittling down the numbers as we go, and then another, another two years or so of, uh, of trialling, 
And then at, at, a, um, at that point, we would uh, share material with um, people we work with, uh, partners in, uh, in other countries, and also in, in the UK, uh, and get sort of feedback from our, um, our customers. So on average, we'd be sowing about 15,000 seeds a year. And uh, after, well, the first year, we might select out up to 500 interesting things that we want to look at again. The first year, you might not get uh, a typical uh, habit of growth because it might be that it doesn't flower straight away and it, um, it becomes a little bit crowded. But, um, we haven't got endless amounts of space, so you may not uh, get a typical uh, growth habit. It might look a bit, little bit stretched. So you're selecting more on the on the flower form in the first season. So uh, after the first season, uh, if we select something. We propagate it vegetatively, and start, so everything started off in the, the second year um, from a, a plug, which is the same sort of size, and you can get a better idea of its growth habit. But after three years of selection, that, that'll go down to about 20. Um, so there's an awful lot of uh, waste, waste sort of through the system, obviously. Uh, and, uh, and then... It, uh, to the end of the selection, uh, the end of the trialing phase, we might just get uh, um, one or two new introductions a year on average. So it's sort of quite, quite a, an intensive process, really. Um, at the point where we've, we, we find some, think something's got good commercial potential, we'll uh, put it into tissue culture so that we can uh, send it out to our, our partners in other countries where it's easier to send material in, in vitro uh, for plant health reasons. And um, also as a, a, a secure, security thing. Um, and then we'll get a reintroduction of uh, clean material uh, I didn't mention the vir virus testing. We, we, it's all virus tested. Everything's virus tested twice a year, um, and we keep it uh, keep it all in the nuclear our nuclear stock area. Uh, so, once something's reached the the, the trialing stage, we um, start off by trialing it in the UK because uh, it's easiest. Um, we have uh, outdoor beds in, on top of our hill. Which I can, you can see it does get a bit of snow and gets a bit cold from time to time. We can't test for extreme cold tolerance where we are because it's too mild. Um, but we can get a good idea of how well they perform over winter. Uh, and we also do appropriate trials for things that are likely to be patio or pot plants and uh, the little dwarf varieties, we'll, we'll try those in pots as well to see how they, how they look, what the balance is like and um, uh, how they compare. They're grown alongside existing uh, varieties that are in the market to see how they compare in terms of flowering, earliness, and we measure all sorts of things with stem length, how long it takes to get to um, a marketable stage and all those sort of factors. And also, we try out any new cut potential cut flower varieties alongside uh, existing cut flowers, and again to measure stem lengths and yields and that sort of thing. The virus testing is uh, we have done on contract by a molecular hybridization technique, which we didn't invent, but somebody else did, uh, a big carnation company, and. Um, it's very sensitive, more so than the old ELISA test. So we, we, can, uh, we feel uh, very confident uh, in the um, cleanliness of the stock. Uh, nothing enters our breeding greenhouse from outside uh, other than in tissue culture form from tested material. Uh, so we have quarantine areas for, for other material that's brought in. So we start off with our nuclear stock. Uh, we have three plants of each variety. Uh, it's kept in a 
uh, an isolated area and um, people wear white coats and all that sort of thing. Uh, it's replaced every year and uh, it, we go back to tissue culture uh, every two or three years. To We don't take it out of tissue culture every single year because there is a danger of uh, reversion or uh, mutation as it goes through the tissue process. Um, we also um, have to test it for true, check it for trueness to type each each time we renew the stock, so it's it's all, all flowered again. Um, so from there, obviously the the bulking up process starts, and we then um, keep uh, a, another elite bay with a, a plants, mother plants. Uh, the number per variety would depend very much on the popularity or expected popularity of the variety and from that we make the, uh, the production stock which we might need say 200 plants for a batch of mother stock or we might want a thousand of a, for a, of a variety if it's a very popular one. This is the next stage so again all in pots uh, all sterilized and you, you can see uh, we're flower checking the plants to um, make sure that they're true to type. And then we move on to the production areas. Uh, yields per plant, I think the average we take from a, a garden pink, one of the bigger leafed varieties, is, is something like 100 or maybe a little bit more, 150 cuttings over the season uh, of a year per plant. And some of the dwarf ones, though, you can e easily get several hundred cuttings over a period. Varieties with bigger uh, shoots, uh, the, the people pick them by just by snapping them. Um, but the smaller leafed varieties are a bit fiddly. Uh, we use uh, little clippers and sterilize those uh, between varieties. Uh, put them into poly bags. Uh, and then uh, we can cold store them. Uh, we're quite fortunate that we can cold store them up, up to six weeks. And um, there are a couple of varieties don't respond so well, so we have to do those from fresh, but most of them are quite happy to be cold stored for six weeks, which is very helpful because it helps to iron out the um, peaks and troughs in demand and allows us to accumulate cuttings for large orders. Uh, this is a particularly small cutting. It's a, a, one of the little alpine types, but, um, putting them in a modular tray. And then those go on to rooting benches. Uh, not, not quite as uh, state-of-the-art as a hish till, but um, with many of the same sort of features. Um, we've got bot bottom heat, uh, boom misting, and uh, shade screens. Uh, and then they're grown on, uh, pinched if necessary, and uh, then the tray's gapped up uh, prior to dispatch to our customers. Sort of the beginning of the export part of the talk, I suppose. Um, being the International Day. Uh, this is a picture in France. We started exporting, I guess, uh, well, over 20 years ago. Um, a, a sort of a, a French marketing cooperative did a, a, a visit to our nursery um, and expressed an interest in having a, a, a relationship with us where we could supply them with some of our, our varieties. And uh, so, uh, it was a company called Viva Plant, and they have several several nurseries, a little bit like far plants in a way, but they, they're had several specialists within their group, uh, but they were geographically spread throughout France, so the numbers were quite attractive, and it was uh, it was quite good. So we, we also sold a little bit into Holland and uh, um, s small quantities here and there in Europe, and then we started going to uh, Hortifair and. Um, the Salon de Vegetal and IPM and interest grew.
if you're going to export, there's certain things you need to have. You need to have some sort of unique product. As Pat was saying, you've got to have something that they want. They can't necessarily grow themselves, or uh, maybe you've got um, some control over your variety. You've got protection for it, and so you can offer it uh, to people uh, in a, another country. And um, so you have to have some control over the product. You, you, you need to have someone to work with, either a direct customer or a sales distributor. Um, it's got to be able to stand the cost of being transported <coughs> to wherever you're selling it. So um, uh, if a lorry can get there easily and the, the product will um, stand the, the time in transit, uh, it comes down to how much it's worth and how much that extra transport will add to the cost. Um, with the young plants, it's uh, relatively, it's, it's, it's affordable, shall we say, for uh, quite a few areas, certainly the near, nearer European countries. The further away you get, the less uh, economical that is, though. Uh, it, it's helpful to uh, be able to speak some other languages. I, I have very poor French, but Carolyn's got German and French and um, Spanish. And we have a French breeder now, so that helps. Um, you have to be committed to exporting. You can go along f to a trade show one year, and then uh, but you can't expect to develop business sort of straight away. It takes quite a lot of time. So um, uh, a long-term commitment's needed. And also, well, obviously, it costs money to build new markets as it would develop any new product. You need to have good partners to work with and we've uh, a few, quite a few of you know uh, the Needhams and Plant Haven. Uh, they've helped us tremendously uh, developing the markets in the USA and so they, they, we've uh, been working with them for a long time now and uh, we've had other, other partners within uh, mainland Europe and um, in Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. Uh, they have to have good knowledge of uh, the industry in their area, and um, ideally with great uh, people with a lot of respect from others in the industry. Uh, you need to have choose partners who have the resources to promote and people who are committed to your product, because it's your baby, uh, and where you need to protect your varieties, they need to have a comprehensive knowledge of the patent system. Uh, and, of course, no conflicts of interest, not representing somebody else with a conflicting product. I mentioned trialling before. Now, in addition to trialling in the UK, uh, one of the sort of learning curves is how many different sort of climatic zones there are and of course uh, the tendency is to try and sort of fit your product into as many areas as possible because uh, you want to sell as many plants as you can so you then need to s say well how would they grow in this environment or that environment and so people would ask questions of us that we weren't able to answer so of course we, um, we have to do trials to sort of show whether or not uh, the plants are suited. This, this is at, at uh, Costa Farms in, um, in, in the south, and uh, it's very hot and humid there. Um, you can see they've got some quite nice trials. I think those are public trials. We also have various private sort of trial locations for test testing new varieties. Um, uh, similar sort of problems in Japan where it's very hot and humid is there as well. Uh, cold tolerance, uh, I mentioned we could only, we maybe only get minus 8 or 10 in Devon, but uh, uh, in parts of the States and Eastern Europe we, uh, we've had plants go down to sort of the minus 20s and uh, they don't always do well because um, if they're grown, if, it depends on uh, snow cover and that sort of thing, and wind chill. But uh, all our varieties are sort of sold as being hardy down to zone five in the States. 
Uh, interestingly, varieties that we thought were a little bit on the tall side and over here can actually be grow quite a bit shorter in uh, high light areas. So in California, um, some of our sort of taller varieties are um, regarded as more compact. In, in addition to having good partners, you need and doing trialing work, you need to be able to promote your um, varieties to sell them. Uh, and uh, so, either you've either got to do it yourself, or your partner, chosen partners, need to represent you. And this is uh, our uh, Plant Havens booth at uh, Ohio, uh, where they made a bit of a feature of uh, Wetman varieties. It's important to have inside knowledge of a market from uh, people in that country because uh, it's difficult to get a handle on things from a distance. So in, in addition to uh, selling the idea of the plants, you've got to be able to back it up with cuttings. So uh, you need to ha have established uh, a source that people can go to. Um, we have here uh, one of our uh, uh, cuttings producers in uh, in America, and they, they you have to uh, have the same sort of attention to plant health and checking trueness to type, that sort of thing, uh, in these other locations, which sort of multiplies the the job up a little bit. Uh, sometimes that's done. They might send photos back of the plants so that you can check that they're correct. Uh, otherwise, you might have to go and visit. Choice of varieties and uh, types uh, vary in different parts of the world. This is one of the sort of more interesting parts uh, of the job, uh, finding out uh, what people want. Uh, in Japan, they like uh, the cherry blossom colors uh, for Mother's Day. Um, in sort of parts of Eastern Europe, uh, a red carnation is sort of is reminds people of uh, communism and in uh, Mediterranean countries they like the strong bright colors whereas perhaps in more northerly uh, sort of less harsh light areas people like pastel seem to like pastel colors so there's a lot of uh, regional variation in, in preferences and this is a display in Japanese uh, garden center showing sort of added value uh, and a display of pinks, how, how they sell things over there. Different ways of growing, so as well as different ways of marketing, there's different ways of growing. I was quite surprised when I visited Japan, uh, and saw a few growers, um, that they left, left a sort of a, about three centimetres of space at the top of their pots. And I said, why, why didn't they fill their pots up? And well, they do all their watering into the top of the pot, you know, individually, by hand. And uh, these, these little slow-release fertilizer pellets that just sat on the top, and they can sort of drop an extra one or two in if they think the plant looks hungry. And it's sort of all done in quite a different sort of way. But and scheduling differences, uh, it's sort of quite demanding to uh, make recommendations for someone in the Southern Hemisphere, for instance, when, uh, trying to get your head around their production cycles. Um, but uh, we have had uh, success, so we have customers getting it, uh, getting it right in the States and uh, in Japan and uh, Australia. So there's a crop there of uh, variety passion just about to be sold.